do their job in a car and you want breakfast in the car, you don't want a croissant because you get a mess in the car. So people start drinking some kind of milkshake. But what is the need of drinking a milkshake at that moment? Is it because you're hungry? Is it because of you're thirsty? Or is it because you don't want to get a mess in your car? Or maybe even more important, uh, you don't want to be bored. And if it takes half an hour to get to your job, it should last about at least 20, 25 minutes because, before you're finished. So actually what you find out is, is a mix of needs actually. Uh, just being hungry, just comfort, easy, no mess in your car and not being bored. And if you have a mix of a functional need, a social need, a moral need, um, an emotional need, then, and, and let's not forget statics. Then if, if you can address them in, in a combination of it and, and development of yourself, then you get a product or a proposition that is never going to be a commodity. And if you can have these types of solutions to customers, then actually you're in a position to build loyal, mutually profitable relationships with them. And that type of understanding is quite interesting. And just going a little bit in, in, uh, in that direction, if you're looking for branding, one of the things that we are looking for in, in a brand is what's your brand promise to your customer? Can you really phrase it clearly in, in maybe in one sentence? Like Nike, and I probably won't say it correctly, but get the best out of you. Everybody is a sporter. Um, and those are really simple values that are in the individual of in the customer itself. And what is this brand promise? And if you really understand the brand promise in relationship to the job to be done, then you have a perfectly valuable brand, a brand value, a brand promise that is a powerful direction for everybody in your organization on a strategic, a tactical and operational level to actually understand what is our purpose, what is our aim to work together, even if we are separated by departments or levels. And, and that is actually quite interesting if we, we can manage that. And then the question is, are we in a position to, to actually build that relationship? And if we start talking about relationships, it is actually something interesting because most of the times in marketing, what was our focus? We want to get the customer in acquisition. And we forgot about, hey, let's build a relationship with them. What we then said is, hey, don't forget the back door. So we started all sorts of programs about retention. But in the meantime, there's something in between. And that is, let's do some cross-selling, upselling. Let's make this custom more valuable for us and let us become more valuable for them. And then we, we have to start building a relationship. And that is much more about understanding a customer, building trust, gaining trust, having mutual interactions, personalizing. And, and, and that's being engaging, not really pushing, selling. And, and, and that's actually quite interesting because now we touch on the core of, of relationship marketing. And that's a field that uh, is, is developing quickly uh, because what you already said, there is uh, digital marketing, there is the social media. And I have to be honest about CRM. Uh, somehow they lost some track uh, at the moment that social media took off. Uh, and also more the online uh, communication. Uh, they were too slow, you might say. Uh, and these are actually wonderful ways to actually, yeah, to have more interaction, personalization, to be there where the customer is. Uh, but we, yeah, CRM as a word, and partly also the, the, the professionals in CRM were too much focused on their CRM system, on relationship building, and they were not moving fast enough 
with those new types of digital technology. Uh, David already, you know, we had a little chat before we started. What you notice is actually that nowadays you even have a new um, term, it's typically marketing business, you might say customer experience management. And actually you might say CRM, uh, the next phase is customer experience management. Because from there on, we are really focused on, hey, I understand this customer. I want to build a relationship with them, but I want to have interactions along the journey. The path the consumer takes. Applying all the channels, online, social, face-to-face. -face. And we want to change the organization to become customer-centric. And, and actually that is, uh, if you're speaking about uh, the latest developments, then that is actually what is actually uh, at the moment uh, taking place. If you want to understand the core, what is a customer, what is a relationship? How are we going to build customer knowledge? CRM is still a solid foundation. I had a question. I was very interested in, in that last remark about um, the struggle for CRM to keep up with social yep. media. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And uh, do you think that's something that will keep keep happening, or do you think uh, people will be able to kind of catch up and stay along with the continuous innovation of social or digital innovations that happen all the time? Uh, in marketing, we keep up, <laughs> but uh, the the word CRM is not that fashionable anymore. <laughs> right. So that's where the experience comes in. Yeah, that's where the experience comes in. Yeah, so it's really marketing. <laughs> say yeah i think that's really interesting that you brought up customer relationship experience i haven't heard that term before and that's really cool um when you talk about customer relation management going out of style and not being able to keep up what could you like explain a bit more about like who like what's in the circle of customer relations management like what's not keeping up like who's not keeping up mm -hmm. yeah if you speak about uh, crm professionals most of the times, uh, they are um, uh, people who are uh, working with the databases. Uh, that's the, the anchor point. Uh, it started with, with the, the, the technology, the databases, and the data, uh, and, and getting to know customers. And from there on, they started to work on building relationships and actually stating, hey, CRM is more than only a technology, it's also a strategy. And because the core of the expert in CRM are in, in databases, uh, you notice they are not in channels. They are not in, in communication. And in that area, you notice there are the, the a very fast uh, moving uh, developments. And yeah, that's not their core expertise. So actually what you notice is, and it happens all the time in marketing, you get all sorts of fragmented specialities uh, and sometimes we bring them together again then, and uh, that's already since the beginning of marketing, actually. Thank you. So let's yeah. start. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so I also had a question. Uh, because of globalization and the widespread of social media, uh, mm -hmm. the, the, a customer can put a review, let's say, about a, any company, 24 hours uh, a day. Yeah. Uh, so do you think that, do you, uh, how do you think the trends are going to change for customer relationship to go along with that? Yeah, and that's an interesting one because what you notice is because of social uh, and also online is what you notice is that the focus of, of, of CRM is on the dyadic relationship. Uh, and what you will find out with reviews is that you also get customer to customer relationships communication and that changes the field so you have to learn to operate in more in a network or on a platform than only in a bilateral relationship and that is also for for marketing and for digital marketing quite a challenge because from the moment you have your own uh, media you can tell your story okay? it's your it's your theater but from the moment I'm among other customers, I'm not allowed to sell. Uh, I have to, to adapt 
to the culture that is I'm part of the public. I have to behave uh, like one and, and you don't like me stalking you, selling something. And in the meantime, we also have uh, some, some paid advertising with the traditional uh, advertising where I can exaggerate a little bit. And I have to learn to play the game in all these media, in, in this landscape. And that works best from the moment you understand uh, who you are, what is your brand promise, what is your target audience, what are their needs, and what is my story? What are the themes that I want to address? And from the moment I have a story, I'm more in the lead. If I'm not in the lead, I have to follow. I have to follow what happens on social media, and, and that's not what I like. Uh, and in the meantime, if I'm in the lead and I'm open, transparent, I will be happy with the feedback and the reviews because if I have a bad review, I know I have to improve something. I, I'm not doing something well. I know I can on social ask those people more in a bilateral environment. Hey, can we discuss this? Can I help you? Hey, you don't do it in the open. But in the meantime, what you also, and we don't do it with web care, is that you want to address uh, the, the, the people who actually give you a compliment. And also those people you want to follow up on. And, and that's not what we're doing most of the times. We, we only focus, or at least in Holland, we only focus on, on the complaints we get. But you, you should also be happy about uh, those people who actually say, hey, you're great. You did a wonderful job. Also do something with that. And, and that's quite a, a different ball game. Uh, and, and then we are speaking about, uh, and that's actually my chair in Amsterdam, uh, about content marketing. Uh, another way of, of, of communicating uh, with, your, with your audience, with your, 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 your people. If you're a customer, and, and can we profile them so we get an idea about it? So actually, it's quite a, a core topic. And... I won't touch so much on segmentation itself. Uh, Professor Dobson will do that. Uh, but uh, if we speak before I start with uh, segmentation uh, and it's related to segmentation, um, let's touch a little bit on customer asset management. And that is actually to get an understanding of what is the value of a customer in an organization and for an organization. And if you take a look at how organizations actually uh, measure the outcomes of marketing, and, and I showed you a little bit in an older book, but there are more than 100 or 500 metrics to measure marketing and to, to say marketing is accountable. That's tough. Then. And, and then actually you measure so many, so many stuff that you hardly know what you're measuring. Eh? You're only looking at, hey, you're desperate and, and if you're on target and, and you have some more strategic uh, uh, targets, share of hearts, minds, markets, and the margins and things like that. But actually, if you really take a look at one of the most interesting metrics is beside brand value, the brand assets value, is actually the customer lifetime value. And if you are taking a look at the customer lifetime value and if you're taking a look at the lifetime value of all your customers, you have actually the value of your organization. And one of my key questions is always, why, why is that not uh, top of mind in, in, in boardrooms? Because hey, there we speak about Stock prices, uh, that's also a, a way to calculate the value of your organization, eh? the, the outstanding stock and the stock prices and you multiply it. And there are other ways to do it. But also, if you take a look at what is the value of my customer base, that's actually quite a key metric for marketing and for the organization. And if we really are performing marketing or customer relationship management or customer experience management, in a strategic way, we should know what are the drivers of the value of our customers and of our customer base. Because then we can really find out 
how can we optimize the value of our organization, of our customer base? And actually, if you take a look at it, we hardly do it. Uh, and that's actually the core of customer asset management. And there are some very nice ways to, to measure it um, in, in the book. And I just pick out this one. And it's an older one. Uh, but it actually, and you, you can have many of these, these, these portfolios, but it actually says, hey, how much does it cost to acquire a customer? And how much does it cost to retain a customer? And we're not speaking about growing a customer even. And if you take a look at this chart, it's quite interesting. Customers with high retention cost, 25% of the clients, 50% of the profit. Royal clients, big customers, powerful, demanding. 28% of, of your customers, 25% of your profit. Hey, actually, if, if you take a look at this, you're doing quite well. Because you're still making a profit on these demanding customers. And you have customers with low retention costs. Sometimes that we call them, um, but they're hard to acquire. But if you've got them, hey, they're in the pocket. Sleeping customers, we sometimes call them. And you have the occasional buyers, they're in and out. Now, and now assume, what will you do if you have to meet your target? What type of customers will you acquire? And you're under pressure in a demanding market. This is if you have a low, uh, if, if customers are easy to acquire and hard to retain, then actually what you'll find out is you're not working on the quality of your customer base. You're focusing on a short-term result. And this happens with a lot of companies under pressure. I've seen companies that actually get in a negative loop, in a spiral, uh, because you get some bad customers in, they leave quite quickly. So you need more customers in next year. So you have more promotion. And because you attract more promotions, uh, or more customers with promotions, they're not that interested in your core proposition. And they're out again. And it becomes worse and worse. And actually, in that sense, and, and then it's quite challenging. Eh? How can you influence sales? How can you steer sales? Hey, don't go for your bonus and, and the signature. Go for the customers that will stay for one or two years or three years. And that's something different. And that is quite challenging. And you can wonder, royal clients, what's really the value of a royal client? They're wonderful for your reputation. Because these are the demanding customers. These are probably the big customers, the A brands, and they are demanding. And if you can satisfy them, they can have them as an ambassador, that will be great. And here you already notice how difficult it is to actually work on, not only on a short term, but on a long term basis on the, the quality of your customer base. And, and this is actually one of the, the core aspects uh, of, of, of actually CRM that on a strategic basis, you work on the value of your, your portfolio of customers. And actually you can only do it by understanding who that customer is. And this is what you could read in the book. Huh? Uh, do I only know you by name? Do I know what you've been purchasing? Do I know how you communicate? What type of buyer you are? What type of user? And what type of human are you? And the more you want to know about the customer, the more you have to invest in, in, in customer insights. And the question is, if, if that's worth it, depends on your strategy. Yeah? If you're a discounter, don't do it. If you're more a niche premium brand, it might be quite interesting to do so. And now you, you notice what one of the, the pitfalls of marketing of, of CRM is, is that they are very much, the origin is more also in, in administration. They're very good in, hey, I know your name and your address, and, and I know the address where I can send the bill to. I know what you bought. I know a little bit about media, but then it stops. And now you notice that media users, hey, people in, in social media on online marketing, digital marketing, get a better idea about who is, the, who is the customer as a communicator. And a buyer profile, 
Yeah, that's again something that, that CRM might know more about. The user profile, maybe service or, or the contact center people know more about it. And the human, that's maybe market research. So actually what you find out is that we have to work together, maybe in an agile way, in multidisciplinary teams to get a 360 degrees of who is the customer. And that is something that we are doing more and more. But to get really an idea about who is the customer, we don't want segments because that's more the statistical aspect. You are between 15 and 25 years old, you uh, living in a household with 1.2 people, you have an income between fifth, it doesn't say anything. I want to see a face and name. I want to see what drives you, who are you? Uh, I want to get an idea about who you are and, and that's personas. Because from the moment I know this is this type of person, I can elaborate on it. Oh, then he will be doing this. Oh, then they will be enthusiastic about this. Oh, they hate this. And from that moment on, I get all sorts of associations. I get an idea about who is this person. And let's be honest, in reality, this person does not exist. It's an archetype. It should not be some kind of character, right? a, a, a cartoon type of person. It should be a real person. Don't fool about it make it real and personas are actually quite old they are up and down uh, we had a period that we were quite enthusiastic about it then digital marketing came up and said personas ha 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 i know individuals really not only in a group but by individual behavior i can track their behavior i can personalize i don't need a persona now I'm speaking about 2005, 2020, even digital marketers are again, content marketers are enthusiastic about personas. There's some kind of revival. Hey, this is wonderful. Also because of service design thinking. So they're back. So that's also possible. <laughs> and you can create personas for, for different purposes. It can be in general, it can be only for communication. It can be for complaints. Let's be honest, if you have a complaining, uh, complaints, how many personas do you need? Three. You have personas that actually want a better deal. Some people who say, will want to hear, hey, I'm sorry, what I did to you is terrible. And the third persona solves the problem. And actually, eh, so it's, it's related to to the job to be done, you notice we, we have some kind of persona. But what's very important is that a persona is built upon drivers, motives, not on some kind of general ideas about education or whatever. No, it is the drivers, the motives relation to the job. And I want to share with you uh, the Alt Duzes case. Uh, I still like it very much. Uh, it was uh, uh, a student, uh, her, uh, her final thesis, and, and we, we uh, or basically she wrote an academic article on it. And, and it's still one of the cases that is so solid uh, because it started with really a segmentation, a segmentation on motivational factors. And there are many academic uh, articles that actually uh, analyze why people are involved in uh, charity sports event. If, if I speak about Alp Duzes, sorry, I'm not telling you uh, anything about it because, of course, you don't know what it's about. Uh, but in, in Holland, uh, we call it the Dutch mountain. It's, we, we live in a flat country and there is one uh, mountain in Austria and we are completely enthusiastic about it. And Tour de France is going over, and, and most of the times we hope a Dutch runner is a uh, biker uh, is, is really uh, number one on that mountain. Actually, it's an ugly mountain, uh, but we like it. And 
Now, there is a charity event that uh, we all start biking in Austria. Yeah? So we drive and, and don't look at footprint, but we drive some, some, some 1,000 kilometers. And then we all start driving on the same day. We start driving up and down that mountain with our bikes. And then we collect money for cancer, research on, on, on cancer. And that's what we're doing. And if you speak about these uh, charity events, then academic research showed why do we participate? Well, it's well-being. So well-being of all. We do it because we are social, we know some, some, somebody. We do it because of humanity. And sorry, well-being is about your own well-being, being supportive. Humanity is, is about everybody having uh, some, some kind of positive health. It's about persistency. And that's particularly for those who had cancer. And you are still on the bike and you manage to, to climb that mountain, you're back. That's, that's actually the, the story. Yeah? And it's about empowerment. Hey, I can do it. I, I'm strong. And it's about the cause. And let's do something about cancer research that, that helps to treat or to prevent it. And these are actually, this is a, a segmentation. Yeah? And, and what, what has been done is we, we did a cluster analysis. So we, we had a lot of data about scoring all these uh, six motivational factors. And we had a cluster analysis and we got four clusters and 98.4 of the, the persons were correctly classified. So it is, it's a good segmentation. And then we said, hey, we have four clusters. Now we start profiling these clusters. And this is actually quite a solid base because in many cases we start with persona just the blue in eye. Uh, we just started, hey, can you imagine some people who are actually the bias and what? No, really evidence-based, research-based. And then you had Laurie, book, segmentation criteria, and also eh, her age, but also how many members are there in her team? In, because you are biking with a group, uh, and how many years has she been participating? And how much money did she bring in? Eh? And, and take a look at the, the, the funds, eh? 35,000 to 50,000 euros she brought in. Eh? So this is really a massive event that is actually, and in, in the top years, there were more people who wanted to participate than we could uh, facilitate on the mountain. So they actually thought about spreading in over two days. So wonderful event. But take a look at Lori. She recently won her latest battle against the illness. So she's really assistance. She's back. She's empowered to master her cycle skills, to share emotional burden together with others, social. Uh, and non-profit organization is appealing to her to make the fight against cancer a national priority. And what is her concern? The event becomes too big, too many people. Lose of focus, corporate participation. But can you imagine what happens if she is on top of that mountain and if she managed it? This guy gives an emotional thrill to this event. This is, this is actually why it is more than just some kind of cycling uh, event. And she is actually, yeah, the carrier, her archetype is the carrier of this event. This, this, this makes it powerful. And then we have Harry, and, and I was like him as well. Uh, Harry is a house junk. And you notice, He's with a group of seven, but he only brings in 23,000 euro. And he's a fanatic athlete. He, it's, it's a healthy lifestyle. Uh, he wants to break his personal record. He wants to be outside in nature. Uh, um, and yes, by the way, but, but that's not the main reason he lost the love friend due to cancer. And he's also there. And really fanatic, eh? Harry the Houston. And take a look at uh, his haircut. This is uh, this is really the the the, the strong guy. Eh? But but the haircut is you notice it's a bike, 
and and the lines it's the shape of the mountain so he's really fanatic eh? and he is there uh, <clears throat> because uh, he and the organization have similar goals he's really doing it for the well-being for not only his well-being but but for everybody having a, a better health uh, he really wants to support research uh, to cancer uh, and take a look at how much money he brings in 130,000 euro first year he participates but he is completely motivated to to really contribute and then we have the last one and uh he's the caretaker uh, look a little kid his son is with him uh also brought in 180,000 euros. Can you imagine? Uh, he wants to give something back to community. Well, you see it in uh, the money, but it's more the emotional burning and, and uh, to be with his family uh, and to raise awareness in the community. So it's it's more in his close uh, yeah, circle that, that he wants to, to do something to contribute. And there are stories about this person. And this is actually quite fun and interesting to get an idea about these people. And uh, uh, you, you, you focus on, on, on the stories people experience. Then you're really, uh, there was once and she lived. She, she had cancer and she, she, she was on a bike and she, she climbed this mountain. You can also focus on a user's role. Uh, hey, how long? How many times will you be there? How long will you be there? Or uh, what type of user are you? Or user profile? This has been done. Sorry, I thought I changed it. Gebruikers category, user category. Uh, but you, you you can profile people in different ways. Uh, so this is an, an, an overview. Uh, and this is more even in detail. But this one is nice. You can work with these types of templates to actually build up the story, the diary of people. What were you doing? Who were you? Why did you do it? What did you read? What did you watch? What was uh, the picture that really illustrates who you are? Uh, what kind of question did you have? Uh, what would be a complaint you would have? What were you looking for? Uh, how would you contact your neighbors? Uh, why will you be frustrated? Why will you be happy? What are your general remarks? So you can get some kind of playbook that, that people can fill in or you can fill in and, and you can really build these personas and, and you can focus on if this will happen to you, what will you do? If that will happen, what will you do? Uh, so you can really get an idea about who that this person is. And I've seen organizations that really built on this and they really have uh, rooms a, a Harry room or a, a William room uh, or a lorry room where you actually have photos, uh, items, decorations that so you really enter Laurie's world. Uh, so it is in you. I've seen organizations that actually also start to score. Are you a lorry? Are you a Harry? Who's a Harry? And then you know the employees. Oh, that's a Harry over there. Yeah, yeah. You, you notice it. See, he, yeah, he's running to the coffee. Yeah, it's typical him. Uh, so it, it, it comes to life and these personas are very helpful, especially if the distance between your organization and the market is, 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 is big and in contact centers or in, in, in retail outlets, in branches where you have face-to-face -face contact with customers and you actually, you don't really know them when you know there is a Harry entering my store. Hey, oh. Immediately, you know, oh, hey, Harry, how's it going? Been biking last week? You know how to start a conversation. Uh, and, and it starts and, and, and you can have a more uh, in-depth uh, interaction with these customers. And in that sense, it's, it's, it's really helpful. And it would be great if you know a person's persona profile in your database. That's quite challenging still. But if you can do that, great. Should they know that they are Harry? No, because probably nobody's perfect for Harry, but probably they will be offended. So do it behind the walls. And, and that's actually why uh, this is quite uh, helpful. Uh, 
be sure that you avoid self-projection. Don't start thinking for the customer, really ask them. But it is very helpful to have a common language and understanding of who are your customers. But criticism is, is never completely reliable. Um, it's also, yeah, maybe false customer centricity because it's not one-on-one, -on -one. it's still a prototype, a target group. And sometimes we hate the empirical evidence. Uh, and also what is it really adding towards the result of our organization. But I've seen people in, in contact centers and in, 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 in interaction with customers working with it, uh, they really had better results, but also much more pleasure in their work. But also be sure that a persona is interesting for maybe half a year or a full year, but then they become irritating. They don't become inspiring anymore. So you can only use them for some time to really build up a deeper understanding of who your customers are, but then they lose their value. And of course, what you really want is to know that persona, but also in the context, where are you? But also the demographics, but also the behavior, because then you get the 360 degrees. And that's actually where you bring data together from mobile, from social, and from CRM. And that's what I started with as well. Hey, you need to work together to build this customer profile. And that is actually what you are looking for if you're working in CRM, customer experience management, digital marketing, uh, if you want to build a more engaging and lasting relationship uh, with customers.